Welcome everyone to JSA TV, where we shine the spotlight on leaders who are shaping the digital infrastructure industry. I'm your host, Laurel Burton. I'm an executive vice president with JSA. And today I am incredibly excited to be joined by Lucas Gentile, CEO of Loft Labs. Loft, Loft Labs. <laughs> Let me say it twice. Lucas, welcome. Awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, why don't we start with a quick introduction? Why don't we start off by you having tell, tell us a little bit about Loft Labs the, and the problems you're solving in today's evolving infrastructure landscape? Absolutely happy to do that. We're an early stage uh, startup in the Kubernetes infrastructure cloud native space, and we launched an open source project called vCluster in 2021. The idea is really to virtualize Kubernetes to make it more efficient. Kubernetes is this widely adopted system to run compute workloads on top of, especially container-based workloads. And it has become the de facto standard for running applications in, in a lot of enterprises, but even you know, used by startups goes way beyond the enterprise. And it abstracts away from a lot of the underlying infrastructure components. The problem with Kubernetes, though, it is very heavyweight um, and it is, you know, used widely and efficiently in, in today's uh, infrastructure world. So we looked at these problems and, you know, we, we're trying to simplify Kubernetes by virtualizing it. And our vCluster project, which we launched in 2021, um, is, a, is a major contribution to making Kubernetes more accessible, easier to use, right? And it solves some of the tenancy problems that Kubernetes has, you know, multi-tenancy, sharing clusters, sharing infrastructure, et cetera. Well, that's terrific. You know, um, maybe leading off of that, we're obviously seeing explosive growth in AI and machine learning these days. Maybe you can explain to our audience the importance of building out GPU capacities for AI. Yeah, that, there's a lot of attention in that space. We're seeing in our customer base, everybody we talk to, how can I run you know, Kubernetes on top of GPUs? How can I make GPUs accessible to my uh, machine learning AI teams, folks that you know, really need that infrastructure? And we're definitely seeing a lot of enterprises, uh, especially this year, try to build in-house capacity for mm -hmm. GPUs. So far, I think the, you know, the available GPUs were mainly uh, getting bought up by all the cloud providers, right? The, the classical tier one hyperscalers, but also a lot of the neo clouds that have been emerging that have been focusing on that space. The capacity of, of GPU production was really constrained in the past couple of years, but a lot of folks want to build these capabilities in-house because they're very sensitive data that they want to train on, uh, that they want to you know, connect to these models. And you don't necessarily want to have that data uh, potentially in the public cloud. So there's a, there's a certain sensitivity, especially regarding these you know, self-learning, more autonomous type systems to have that in-house in your own data center. And you know, with production capacities, increasing, uh, especially this year, I think we're seeing a lot more enterprises now pull the trigger on, okay, let's buy some of these NVIDIA GPUs, put them in our own data center and build you know, Kubernetes clusters on GPUs to make them accessible to our teams. So we're definitely seeing that across the board. It's a, it's a, it's a really important trend and there's a lot of importance in you know, owning part of that infrastructure in-house rather than you know, just consuming the cloud resources. Well, so speaking of Kubernetes, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the role that Kubernetes is playing when it comes to delivering those GPUs to AI practitioners in the enterprise. I think Kubernetes is the fundamental abstraction layer for compute these days. Whether that compute is CPUs or GPUs, right, uh, or TPUs, right? Like there's there's new chips being designed and built every day. Right. But the primitives of Kubernetes is really, you know, how, how do you design that large scale system that can orchestrate all of that infrastructure that gives you an API to launch workloads on that infrastructure? And to be honest, Kubernetes was very designed for the traditional, let's create a bunch of VMs, let's 
wire them up in a cluster, very CPU focused, right? Uh, there's, for example, the resource quota object in Kubernetes, which stat statically lets you say, I need three CPUs, right? Now, if you apply this to GPUs, what does it mean I need three GPUs? Mm -hmm. That can be a commodity GPU that's really cheap, or it can be a H100, which is incredibly expensive, or the new Black World series, right? It's, it really matters what kind of hardware you're referring to. And you know, Kubernetes, uh, they recently introduced uh, DRA, dynamic resource allocation, and these kind of features now makes Kubernetes much more adjustable and flexible for these new hardware patterns that we're seeing. Um, but it is still, you know, people clearly in the market want to run workloads with Kubernetes on top of GPUs. And Kubernetes will have to evolve and is evolving already to accommodate all of this new hardware that is being built right now that is tailored for, for this new, you know, wave of AI compute that we're seeing these days. Well, that makes sense. Thank you for walking us through that. So as more teams are running these AI workloads on shared systems, what's the best way for the data centers to keep things running efficiently, but without sacrificing speed? Yeah, that's always, that's always a good question in terms of, you know, speed versus efficiency. We've seen this in the early days of Kubernetes even, you know, the, the, the trend was really, let's get Kubernetes up and running. Kubernetes is 11 years old at this point, right? It's, it's a very established system, but only recently over the past couple of years, people have asked themselves, how do we run it efficiently? Because the first probably, you know, seven, eight years, it was really about how can we run it at all, <laughs> right? Now can we get it in people's hands because people want to build on top of Kubernetes. We're seeing today the same thing happening with GPUs. People acquire GPUs, they sign long-term contracts with the Neo Cloud, for example. Um, they're ordering hardware and they don't necessarily think about running it as efficiently as possible quite yet, because the first question is really, how do I get it? How do I hand it out? How do I not sacrifice speed? But the more experienced and the more uh, you know, operationalized the, these environments get, the more experienced the company gets in, in running GPUs and also the bigger the investment gets that they're making in, in GPUs and in this kind of infrastructure, the efficiency question will come up. And part of our answer here uh, that we hope to contribute uh, as part of the, the solution uh, is virtualizing Kubernetes. The idea is really instead of you know, creating five static Kubernetes clusters and then mounting you know, 20 you know, GPU nodes into each one of these clusters very statically, instead you create one large Kubernetes cluster and then you launch virtual clusters on top that dynamically get their nodes from that pool of available, you know, maybe you have 100 uh, DGX nodes or GPU nodes from another provider, right, in your data centers. And wouldn't it be nice if you handed out five virtual Kubernetes clusters and, you know, your business units or your different AI teams would dynamically get GPU resources as they consume them. Um, that really improves efficiency because today with that static allocation of like, you get a cluster, I give you three GPUs, well, these three GPUs are now allocated to you, your team, your business unit. Nobody else can use them. And you know, unlike CPUs, you can't just say, okay, let's spin up another 100 and hand them out because you may not have that capacity, right? You may have to wait six months till they get delivered. They're very, very expensive as well. So the decisions around how to slice things up are really tricky in enterprises today because you want to make sure that you know you don't give too much capacity to one part of the business that may only need it temporarily in the next month, right? Another part could really use it, but you're not as dynamically in redistributing things very, very quickly. And that's where speed comes into play as well, right? You can optimize for efficiency, but at the same time have speed if you have automated systems that automatically rebalance these nodes. And that's what we're doing with vCluster. I think that's one of the biggest contributions we have in this space is that dynamic allocation of GPU resources to different teams and then a logical layer of abstraction on top. And we call that virtual clusters. Oh, that's exciting. And that makes complete sense as you say it. Next question for you. So we have many organizations that are obviously looking beyond the typical hyperscalers for more flexible infrastructure options. 
what should the data center operators focus on in order to meet that rising demand when it comes to those GPU solutions? Yeah, I think definitely one of the biggest reasons to go to the cloud in the first place, right? Even if you look at the first, you know, cloud offering, EC2, right? Um, Elastic Compute, that's literally the name that AWS gave its cloud. And the reason for that is, you know, the beauty of the cloud is you can request the capacity on demand. You can scale it up and down as you need it. That, that's a beautiful thing. Um, that is not as helpful if you're looking at GPUs where, you know, GPU resources, again, require a higher level of commitment or are incredibly expensive if you, you know, if your demand fluctuates so much. So people definitely look into what is our base demand here in terms of GPU usage and can we bring that in-house? Because it may be much cheaper to operate that in-house. There, there may be certain workloads you can you know, obviously flow over to cloud providers. There may be a certain set of operations they can also help you with. But I think the biggest part for, for enterprises is if I decide to buy static compute, whether it is static amount of compute capacity, whether I buy it from a cloud provider and they operate that Kubernetes cluster and these GPUs for me, and I commit to it for three years, right, to get a reasonable price, or I'm saying I'm even buying the hardware and putting it in my own data center and operating it. Mm -hmm. The question is always, how do I stay flexible? How do I make sure I'm not locking myself into, you know, provisioning hell where I'm essentially saying, okay, I made a static allocation of resources here and there and rebalancing is really hard. So I think that's a, that's a challenge that a lot of folks have. And, you know, part of why, the cluster is an open source project and why we designed it the way it is designed, not as a SaaS offering or anything like that. You run the cluster yourself. Part of the beauty is you can run it in the public cloud and in the private cloud, and you can cover these hybrid scenarios as well with the same technology stack. And it has a lot of benefits for these operators because they're always looking at standardization, simplification, but at the same time, they care a lot about, you know, speed, performance, um, but also this flexibility. And the vCluster, you have it, you can essentially say, hey, there's a vCluster that automatically scales up and down in terms of its nodes and tenants really get the compute that they need in that particular moment, even if you run on a static set of hardware in your private cloud. Sometimes people wonder, you know, is your tool, is vCluster going to help me save cost in the private cloud? Because we already bought these servers. <laughs> already there. We already bought these GPUs, right? It's not going to get any cheaper. In, you know, AWS or Google Cloud, obviously, if you, you know, reduce cost and you don't have a long-term commitment for that particular machine, you do actually save cost. But in the private cloud, how does it look there? And I always answer to folks, well, wouldn't you like to have freed up capacity so you can reallocate it to folks who need it in your organization. Maybe you wouldn't have to order quite as many, you know, new servers next year. And there's actually a big benefit to obviously doing that. At the same time, you know, you may actually save on things like bandwidth or you save on things uh, like electricity. It's a big topic in GPU land as well. There's so many benefits in dynamically, you know, spinning hardware up and down, even if you're in the private cloud. Got it. Well, let's stay with vCluster for a moment. Looking ahead, what is the future for vCluster, especially with regards to this GP workloads you're talking about? Yeah, what we're really working on with vCluster is getting a deeper integration into the systems that people use today to operate their GPU infrastructure. Um, and that means vCluster natively talking to these servers and for us to figure out ways, how can we potentially dice up an individual server that has like eight GPUs in them? Mm -hmm. Because maybe one of your tenants um, may just need two GPUs at the time, but you only have you know servers that have eight GPUs in them. So wouldn't it be nice to dice it up? Traditionally, you would use virtual machines here, but in GPU land, a lot of people want the bare metal performance, obviously, because the hardware is as expensive. But, you know, the other maybe lesser known argument here is that the software layer is always behind. 
GPUs are developing so quickly, the drivers are getting updated so quickly, right? New capabilities are being added there on the software layer that a virtualization uh, layer with a separate kernel on top that has not just overhead, it is also often behind on the state of the art. And, and that's a really challenging situation. You know, even uh, GPU manufacturers, uh, some of them are discouraging the use of VMs and tell their, you know, their customers are obviously looking at their tool set because that is what they know in the traditional CPU based world. Let's just, you know, take a big beefy machine, split it up with virtual machines. But in GPU land, there are a lot of downsides to that. So new solutions need to be found. And, you know, earlier this year, we launched a project called vNode, which applies similar patterns than vCluster, but to the actual server, to the actual node in a Kubernetes cluster to help split up that node. So you have vCluster splitting up your Kubernetes cluster, and then you have vNode splitting up the actual nodes without creating, you know, the overhead of, of running a separate virtual machine. But we're obviously flexible. We are also integrating with solutions like KubeWord, for example, if you wish to go the VM route. And for us, it's really, the importance is that whole spectrum of multi-tenancy. We want to cover it all. Whether you want complete isolation, vClusters getting their dedicated bare metal GPU servers directly, um, or you split up you know, with VMs, or you use something like uh, virtual nodes with vNodes, we want to give you the flexibility on do whatever is best for you and for that particular use case that you're using it for. That's really what we're working on right now. A terrific set of solutions and thank you for all of those explanations. And really thank you for joining us on JSA TV today. I appreciate it. Terrific insights into AI, into Loft Labs and obviously the data center sector. Thank you. And to our audience, we thank Lucas, but I want to thank our audience as well. Thank you for tuning in. Stay curious, stay connected, and happy networking.